Hello everyone and welcome to the second lecture on Vincent van Gogh. This is part one of the second lecture uh, and it's always nice to start the second half of Vincent's career I think with a portrait of Pierre Tanguy. This is the famous art supply seller if you will. Uh, most of the uh, impressionist kind of worked and got their, their supplies through him. Uh, I love seeing this image because it, it, it shows us uh, really where Vincent is at as he leaves Paris um, for Arles uh, in order to continue his work, but it also gives us this huge example of how many Japanese prints uh, Vincent Van Gogh actually owned. Uh, you can see he literally formed like a wallpaper with them uh, in the background of the portrait of Tanguy. Uh, and again, when we look at Tanguy himself, when we look at the style of the brush strokes and how he's composing things, uh, this is kind of at the end of the, the time in Paris. And as it says, uh, he eventually will move to Arles uh, in February 1888. Uh, and again, he does this for many different reasons. One of them is, is probably his health. Uh, again, he, he was a, a person who drank way too much absinthe and uh, probably frequented the brothels way too much. Uh, had very poor nutrition, uh, so and, and also was a, uh, a incredibly heavy smoker. Just to add to the mix, so uh, that might have been one of the reasons he kind of came out here. Uh, the other idea is, of course, he is going to form this artist commune. Uh, we were going out, kind of out uh, in the country, if you will, uh, where different artists were going to come uh, to the site of Arles and then uh, uh, share the studio space with Vincent, uh, and and of course share ideas. Ideas and, and propagate this newer style of art. Uh, this is a shot just from the countryside of Provence, uh, the area in and around where uh, Arles is located, and you can it's just a beautiful field of sunflowers. Uh, again, we know very famously Vincent painted sunflowers. It's, it's very easy to see where he might have gotten this inspiration from. Uh, and again, in the, in the local fields, you have uh, uh, farm fields, cultivating fields, and, and what we see uh, from the work in Arles is really this kind of effort uh, uh, to paint those type of things. Again, if we remember early on, Vincent painted uh, peasantry, or at least he drew, excuse me, he drew peasantry uh, as one of his primary subjects. Uh, and this is kind of almost a return to that uh, with the incorporation of the fields and, and the local area as well. This is a time period of, of um, just immense production for Vincent van Gogh. Uh, again, uh, this is a view of, of the local, uh, excuse me, this is a little bit off of the, the, the beaten path of where we are located, but again, I thought this was a wonderful example just to look at those fields. Uh, this is most likely lavender again. If you were here for the lecture uh, on Paul Cezanne, or if you've seen the lecture on Paul Cezanne, uh, this is something that they grew in, in the area of Provence. Uh, again, he's not terribly far away from where uh, Paul Cezanne was actually painting. Uh, uh, once you get out into kind of the countryside, it's, it's not a, a, a huge area, if you will, uh, uh, as much. So we, we, we see a lot of the paths kind of intersect and, and cross between those two individuals uh, as much as all of the other Impressionists. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a, a, a time of just profound pr production for Vincent. Uh, a lot of this is he's painting uh, to get his studio space, his house together uh, uh, for other artists to come and see. Uh, this is the very, very famous bridge at, uh, at Arles that, that he painted. And, and again, when we look at this, we really kind of view the composition uh, as being influenced, if you will, by Japanese prints and, and Japanese style of art. Uh, again, it's interesting because when you look at Japanese art, they have this tendency, uh, it's in some ways very similar to how landscape paintings were done where uh, they're kind of removing uh, the individual as, as the key aspect and pushing them back into the landscape without the direct importance. Uh, uh, with Japanese prints, this is even farther removed where you literally see people uh, commencing in activities of, that they would just see in the everyday. Uh, with the European trend, there's a little bit more of this idea of uh, the, the figure having a relationship with the landscape. Uh, what we do find is a lot of outdoor paintings uh, during this time. And this very much suits the style of painting that we associate 
uh, with Vincent Van Gogh. Again, he's using very, very thick brushstrokes, very large buildups of paint. We use the term uh, impasto, which means just that, this thick buildup of paint on the surface. Uh, and if you think about vegetation, if you think about foliage and that type of thing, uh, it really works well with this style because what you can do is you can make uh, the actual brushstroke, the actual buildup, into uh, uh, an aspect of the plant, either the stalk or the flower or or what have you. In this way, uh, what he's doing is he's almost combining smaller aspects of sculpture, three-dimensional thinking, uh, into the the what we would associate with a painterly two-dimensional surface. Again, looking at the vegetation uh, and developing what we think of as this texture, but the texture itself, uh, it's not random. It's not just placed uh, uh, in, in, in uh, the same way throughout the painting. Again, when we look at something like our view from the wheat fields uh, and we see the city off in the distance, uh, we, we can see he's building up the texture of the wheat. And what this forms, and, and in some ways this is why Vincent van Gogh's paintings are so uh, wonderfully hypnotic, is he makes all of these patterns and rhythms uh, within the painting itself within the wheat. So when we're looking at the texture patterns of the individual shoots uh, going up, it's forming a, a rhythm across uh, the, the canvas surface, which we kind of read into. And, and again, uh, our brain very much enjoys that type of thing. So we look at these canvases uh, and we look at uh, the many combinations that he's putting forth together. Uh, Harvest at La Croix, uh, again, this is one of the more famous from the series. Uh, if we look at the foreground and we look at how he's using that brush stroke to make uh, the fence, and then as we move closer to the foreground, uh, again, if you look at the individual brush strokes forming the patterns on the wheat, but then as we move farther back into the distance, uh, he adopts geometric forms. He has, we have the, the, the buildings in the countryside and, and these wonderful wagons as well. Uh, again, this is where Vincent would go out and paint. Uh, uh, it was extremely hot and, and uh, uh, you hear these stories that he, he got a little sunbaked when he was actually out there in the fields, but uh, nonetheless, this is what we really see. Uh, you could almost call this entire period of work, if you will, uh, or at least I think of it as, as Vincent's yellow period because of the amount of yellow uh, we see in all of the paintings, this vibrant color that uh, he is so incredibly attracted to uh, in, when, when he's painting in Arles. Uh, and again, Iris is in the foreground, but we hardly even notice the irises in comparison to the deep yellow or uh, the, the, the passionate yellow that we have. Uh, this is a very nice painting because we have this wonderful strip of green uh, kind of jutting across to the corner. Uh, and this is amplified again uh, with the trees in the background. And, and again, just to, a reminder of, of what he's really doing here that's so interesting uh, is the variety. If we look at the foreground and we see the brushstrokes forming uh, the individual pieces of the iris and then we look how he kind of made a patchy cloudy sky uh, and then somewhere in between we have these trees that look like they're almost done in a pointillist style. Haystacks in Provence from 1888 uh, again, when we look at this, we really do see this as, as a, a, a typical Van Gogh painting. We can almost follow the texturing on the uh, what we imagine to be the, the surface of the earth uh, of this hay moving up into the haystack itself. Uh, and when we look at the haystack on the left, it really does project uh, out of the canvas surface. You can see that thick buildup. And again, uh, that makes this texture that really, really is appropriate uh, for what he is painting. And again, when we look at things like this, uh, uh, we need to remind ourselves that these are incredibly formulated works within the uh, within the mind of Vincent van Gogh, uh, that these works, again, he's very passionate about this. And as we've seen from the earlier part of his life, uh, he has a profound amount of drawings uh, that usually go into his paintings. And this is just one example of this where we have two separate drawings of what will be the composition uh, we just looked at. And what's really interesting uh, when you look at the drawings at this time uh, is he almost adopts the same style with pen and ink uh, that he's doing with his paintings. Again, when we look at early Van Gogh drawings, they're very realistic 
uh, almost an effort to be academically correct. And when we look at something like this, uh, again, he's forming spaces uh, and, and surfaces by a patchwork of, of information rather than directly going after it. If you look at this, especially the image on the right, and the amount of open space he has, the amount of white, the amount of areas that he's not touching the, the surface, uh, this is really remarkable, but at the same time we get this very thick sensation. Uh, wheat stacks with reapers. Uh, you will also start to notice the little curvy lines that we very much associate with Van Gogh as well. Uh, and again, when you look at this, there is a, a, a farmer or a, a reaper, if you will, uh, directly almost in the exact center of the canvas, and, and we miss it almost the first time we look at things. We're so hypnotized by the swirling texture uh, in the entire scene, it's almost as if this tiny little person disappears into the ground itself. And again, this is really uh, what we think of as the influence of the Japanese style of, of having people in the landscape but not having them be the entire focal point of the landscape uh, almost as if you can dismiss them uh, within the context of the work. Again, just an amazing, amazing use of texture. It's also this time that we have, of course, the very famous sunflower paintings. Uh, we look at these two, they are remarkably similar, but they are in fact uh, two different paintings. If you look at the vase, you can see the signature uh, is very different between the two. Uh, but again, all of this is, is kind of this work that he's doing uh, with this idea of, of, of the creation of the interior of, of what will be known as the Yellow House. Uh, and just to show you how much Vincent van Gogh loves yellow, uh, when you look at these compositions, that's almost the only color he's using. Again, we have just this very, very soft hint of blue uh, that kind of makes its way in and a little bit of red on the one on, on the left. Uh, but most of this, you could almost call this yellow on yellow on yellow uh, in terms of, of what he's doing. Uh, and again, the sunflowers read very well into that textured style. The postman Joseph Roland uh, in in the town uh, um, Arl. This is thought to be one of the only people uh, that actually got along or enjoyed the company of Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, again, when we look at his history, we we, we kind of glean this certain perception of the individual, and that uh, individual carries forward to the town of Arl. Uh, he wasn't well liked at all, and in, in fact, most of the people in the town uh, really didn't like him very much at all. Uh, Joseph Roland here uh, was the exception. Again, he was the postman, uh, but in my opinion, the postman is someone who, who generally gets along with most of the people uh, in a town. That's almost one of their professions. Uh, but we look at this and we, we really do see almost a changing of the style uh, of the dynamic, if you will, of how he's approaching portraiture. And then we get to the famous yellow house. Uh, the postman was actually the one, uh, uh, as the story goes, that recommended uh, that Vincent find this location. Uh, and the corner building is really the, the yellow house that we're talking about. This is the famous location where uh, we have Vincent van Gogh and Paul Gauguin living together. Uh, and again, they only live together for a very, very short time. This is kind of this concocted dream that we have of this artist's studio uh, that never really pans out. Uh, directly to our left uh, uh, of the yellow house, we have a grocery. Uh, and if we continue that, that, that line and we see this little pink building between the trees, uh, that is a cafe. Uh, so we do get this kind of perception of, of the town that they're living in. Of note, it should be mentioned that there were several other artists uh, who kind of came through this area and worked with Van Gogh for a while. Uh, other than Paul Gauguin, he's just the most noticeable name uh, that we associate with it. Uh, and now we really do get into to what we think of as the more renowned works by Vincent van Gogh. Vincent's bedroom uh, in, from 1888 in Arles. Uh, again, when we look at this and we look at how he's painting this, uh, this is the culmination of all of these different aspects of his work. Uh, but what we're really kind of getting into here at the end of it uh, uh, is the simplicity uh, that he's able to accomplish as well as building up all of these ideas that we've seen before. But we also see Vincent channeling these ideas and creating moods and, and atmospheres. Again, looking at the soft tones, uh, this is a wonderfully comfortable place in our minds. This is somewhere uh, you'd like to jump into that bed and take a nice soft nap.